Human-caused climate change is fundamentally changing the fabric of the weather as we know it. It's leading to events which we've simply never seen before. Translation, weather used to be clouds. Now we've made it into a sort of Rottweiler on steroids that wants to chew everyone's head off. The continuing increase in global average temperature is already causing higher probabilities of extreme rainfall and flash flooding, as well as more intense storms, prolonged droughts, record-breaking heat waves and wildfires. Very soon climate scientists are just going to ditch their graphs and point out the window with an expression that says, I fucking told you. This is Wicked Problems. I'm Richard Delavan. I'm Claire Brady. And what you just heard, colourful language and all, with comedian Nish Kumar translating some client science messages for Dr. Freddie Otto, a professor at the Grantham Institute at Imperial College London and co-founder of the World Weather Attribution which, with its ability to show how climate change makes individual natural disasters more likely, has made her even more intimidating than her Cadillac earrings. Seriously, you do not want to know Dr. Owen. The unlikely pairing was in a recent video from Climate Science Breakthrough, the brainchild of Nick Aldridge, a sustainability advocate and marketer, and Ben Carey, who spent a career working as creative director in the UK's most storied ad agency. Listen carefully to any great stand-up comedian, and you realize they're not talking about joy. They're taking something painful and turning it inside out. It's not easy, and most of us wouldn't stand in front of strangers and try. But if you make someone laugh, something weird happens in their brain. They're more likely to listen and remember what you have to say next. But turning the darkest materials into comedy that shakes you out of your preconceptions without just preaching is tough. Egyptian comedian Bassem Youssef just about pulled that off when interviewed about Gaza last month. It's just like those Palestinians, they're very dramatic. Ah, Israel killing us. Uh, but they never die. I mean, they always come back. You know, they're, they're very difficult to kill, very difficult people to kill. I, I know because I'm married to one. Mm. I tried many times, couldn't kill her. <laughs> I mean, there's a dark humor there, and I understand why. Because no, it's not dark humor. I really, I try to get to her every time, but she uses our kids as human shields. I can never take her out. Possibly leaving people more disposed to do something, and, well, with an added bonus of leaving Piers Morgan speechless. Climate change is almost as tough a topic. But that does seem to be changing. Matt Winning is a climate researcher who's been doing comedy for years at Edinburgh and beyond. And the southeast of England? Yeah. The southeast of England's about to become the single best place in the entire world to own a vineyard. So, if you're some sort of, I don't know, middle-aged, homeowning, fixed eyes a leave voter who's like, finally, we've left Europe. Well, I've got news for you, mate. You're about to become French. <laughs> and if you're Scottish and you're going, ha, 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 you're about to become English. <laughs> American Raleigh Williams went the other way, starting as a stand-up doing Al Gore impressions, then going to grad school to learn enough climate science to do his own material. A favorite target is influencer campaigns by the fossil fuel industry. Oh boy, do I love my gas stove. Oh boy, do I love slopping together a big wet lunch on my gas stove. Hashtag cooking with gas. And posted. Sorry, I just had to do a quick Instagram post about just the vague concept of the gas stove. A very real thing the natural gas lobby is quietly paying influencers to do. Just to remind us that we love gas. And if anyone should, I don't know, try to get us to stop using gas for any reason, then it's a war on dear sweet gas. And he's built a huge following for his Climate Town channel on YouTube. Aldridge and Carey's project took this in a different direction, juxtaposing comedians like Nish or Jonathan Pye with some of the world's top climate scientists. The three videos released so far have gained more than three million views online, and they're about to release a fourth with a star they say is a national treasure. So we thought this would be a good time to catch up with them. Here's our conversation. And we're so delighted to be here today with Nick Aldridge and Ben Carey. Great to be here. Uh, good to be here. Thanks for joining us. And so tell us a little bit about the origins of this project of Client Science Breakthrough, and where did the idea of pairing up comedians with climate scientists come from? Well, I guess that's for me to kick off. I kind of work in the climate space. My work for Nature Save Insurance and I'm an ambassador for the climate and ecology bill, the Zero Hour campaign, but I still felt like I was a spectating on the sidelines. And I guess 20 years ago, that would have been fine because 
the things we need to be doing. You could almost file under nerdy policy and that happen behind the scenes and we'd do emissions cuts of a couple of percent a year and people sort of wouldn't really notice and hey, here we are, emissions rising, weather systems falling apart. And, right. You know, I'm, I'm getting genuinely afraid and scared and thinking, okay, well, I can't assume other people are going to solve this. You know, the managed transition idea is kind of gone. I've got this real sense of time ticking, time running out. And I think mm -hmm. basically gave my, myself a, a kick up the, the behind really. Um, right. And I went from, okay, stop thinking could, should do something and actually do something because this is one of those pivotal moments. We need to get a seismic shift in our society. So, so I don't think I'm talking about teaching the public right. climate change. They all know what that is, but, but how many people know what a carbon budget is or can name a climate scientist? Most people think, oh yeah, climate change, something for the future that happens far away and probably doesn't involve me just yet. Right. So the sense of urgency, the sense of immediacy, and you wanted to bring that to life, but why comedy? Why, why is that a root in? Let me tell you how it happened to me. I know I went through those stages of like, oh my goodness, I've got this deep sense of fear. Now I understand all that. I've got this sort of outrage when I understand who's pushing against it. And I've got all this hope coming in when I can see all these solutions, right? I need to tell everyone I know about this. I've got my head around this. And so I send them newspaper articles. They don't read them. I send them reports like the, I remember sending the Chatham house report from a few years back about, you know, future impacts. Nobody read that. It's, it's too long and it's boring and it's dry. And there was this one particular presentation by Kevin Anderson that I thought this is devastating stuff. I need to send this around, but it looked like my son had recorded it in one of his university lectures and sent it to me on WhatsApp. You know, it wasn't a good bit of production, despite what was being said in the, you know, in the, in the, in the talk. And in my head, I just brought in my, I suppose my marketing background and went, said to myself, okay, what if we took this talk, this climate scientist or any other climate scientist and gave them the proper professional creative treatment that we give to all the products we buy and, you know, phones and fashion and cars and all that kind of thing. But what if I would go and find some advertising people and say, I need to make this man get listened to by everybody. And that's, that was the genesis of the idea. You know, the comedians came later because I was lucky enough to fi find Ben and Henrik, his colleague of the Utopia Bureau, threw my idea at them. They didn't laugh at me, which was quite, which was quite appealing. And this had this back and forth. And then, then the minute that idea came up from the two of them, I just thought this is it. This is the way we going to cut through and communicate with people. And I just, um, just wanted to jump in on that there, because I think one of the things that will help know whether you're actually hitting the market, are you finding that you're reaching a different audience this way? You know, how, what's the sort of feedback been to the videos that demonstrates that actually this Co like use of comedy is getting that cut through and bringing a new audience into this conversation? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, that the, the whole point, uh, you're, you're quite right, of using comedians is to, is to reach audiences who, who aren't listening so far. You know, like the, the, the climate bubble will listen to a lecture from scientists, but no one else will. So, so we've deliberately try to find comedians who kind of have that range. And, uh, I mean, Nish Kumar, who, who's our latest, obviously, uh, is a household name and there are people who listen to him for laughs and, and don't listen for, for lectures. Um, and I think that the, the proof of the pudding so far is that we, we've been particularly on social, just, uh, retweeted, uh, colossally, like by very quite mainstream figures like Gary Lineker. Uh, uh, loves it. He's, you know, he's got, I think, 9 million followers. Illy Golding um, has got even more followers. There's just been a wide, wide range of people exposed to it. And, and that we're also continuing with in, in the PR side of things. We're looking to get on daytime TV, places where you would never get a climate scientist or climate science usually. Right. I mean, if I could just follow up with that, I mean, with the most recent video with Nish and with Freddie Otto from the Grantham Institute at at, um, at Imperial, the um, I mean, I suppose people would have read her name. They might have heard her on Radio 4 um, and, and they might not have been used to seeing her, particularly with the battle axe earrings um, and the slightly scary demeanor. What was she like to work with on set? <laughs> 
I, I love those earrings. I mean, they are, they are a, a statement of intent. Um, she, she's great and she's very uh, approachable, but she, she's not, um, the, 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 the scientists are not, are not comedians, right? They, they, it's not that, um, you know, in private, they don't speak human or they don't, you know, swear even or anything like that, but, but they can't, uh, you know, carry, uh, scientific authority if they stray beyond a certain language. So in, in some of them are great communicators, but they obviously still have to be scientists. And so we need to kind of go beyond that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and really the point of comedians, is not just they're funny, but also they can tell it like it is that, mm. I mean, that is almost their job is to kind of cut through, you know, all the nonsense and just get to the emotional nub of, of mm -hmm. what's going on. And I know that one of the questions that, you know, you, when you went to, um, you know, get them to uh, kind of have a, a post game, as it were, get some reaction from, uh, you know, the scientists to see what they thought of their, their translation into, into English, into comedy, um, you know, that was an interesting moment of some, some candor. Uh, and I suppose the language got a bit fruity in, in some cases, but that's how people speak. Um, Where, you know, how, how do the scientists in general react? And any, anything you tell us about that? I think it was it was great. I mean, I remember one of my favorite memories of one of the uh, earlier shoots is to see uh, our science professor Joe Haig, who's you know professor of atmospheric physics and has been an IPCC contributor, and you know, and and uh, just to see her watch Jonathan Pye, you know, string together some of the foulest language you've ever heard, and she's just you know cracking up. So I, I think there's there's something very liberating for scientists to to hear the science conveyed in the way they probably feel it it should be conveyed, you know, to try and get it across emotionally. Um, but they they were all up for it. We we yeah I, I think we there was only maybe one scientist who wasn't sure, but everyone else we approached mm -hmm. said yes immediately. I think a lot of them. I sense they felt grateful that someone was taking a job that's being given to them that isn't really their job out of their hands. I mean, they are very good at what they do and professional about what they do and clear as to what they do. And it's not really their job to then apply it to us and society and the wider life and all the impacts and everything else that goes with it. And I think that's taken them outside their comfort zone. Some are making great efforts, but when they when they see someone step in whose job it is to stand up there in front of the potential hecklers and the people who might shoot them down, you know, and 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 communicate it in that very human way as observers of society, observers of culture, I think they felt that a weight had been taken off their shoulders. And as Ben said, I think I I, I had a near heart attack when the swearing started, and here I am. We'll put all this money into this, and will the climate scientists like this? And 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 yeah, they 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 really responded well to that. Um, I just want to sort of pick up on that idea that, you know, obviously the climate scientists have been trying to communicate this. And, and I think your research showed just how pessimistic they are because they know the science compared to members of the general public who show less pessimism. So do you feel that's an important part of trying to bring the humour in is almost that wake up moment that we need to have and that through humour, we can get people to engage with that message? Is that a key thing you're trying to achieve here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, hu humour disarms, doesn't it? You know, if, if it, it gives you, you know, a, a, a bit of time to get through to people. It's not so I think, you know, in the, in the US, it's probably even worse where you've got very strong um, denial still. But even in the UK, it's probably more the idea that you don't want to know. And so you don't want to listen and, and, you know, you will listen to the comedian and you're expecting jokes. That's going to be funny. If we can get, if we can get the message across in a way that, that resonates with you and you think about it, then that, that's what we're trying to do. And we, you know, we did research, um, you know, focus groups on the first two we did earlier in the year. And, and broadly, they went down very well. I think like something like 87% of people said they were more likely to take climate action having seen them. I mean, our researcher was kind of gobsmacked at, at, the, at, the, at the scores. So we're hopefully on, onto something that, that might be working. And, and you can't always say that in, in the climate world. 
I think I think I'd like to add this this element of the comedy is the cut through, but I think it's I always go back to what I felt was the process that I went through that, like I was saying earlier, deep fear, and then you move it into outrage. And I picked this up from you guys know of Genevieve Gunter, the Renaissance scholar who sort of came into the climate space with a sort of Shakespearean outlook and said, you guys are just talking science stories. That doesn't work. You've got to tell an epic. Mm. You've got to turn it. You can scare people. That's okay. Even though some climate people have said that's the wrong way to go. But you can't just scare people. You have to have the outrage at the actions of those trying to stop everything that we're doing. And, and it's the outrage that fuels action. And I, that really resonated with me, especially when you add in the huge list of great solutions we've got from you know technology to nature-based solutions. So there is that recipe for me that you have to get scared at that primal level to sort of really wake up, as you mentioned, Claire, then you, you then you really awake. But the out it's the outrage that is the engine of of making you say, right, I need to go up against this. I need to compete with this, fight against this. I'm now going to use some of my own money to work on this message because there are other people using lots of their money to to send us in the wrong, wrong direction. You know, we're decarbonizing rapidly. We've got exponential growth, but we know it's not going fast enough. And as some of your previous guests have alluded to, it could easily slow down because people are spending money on that. So here we are with all the best technology, with the moral high ground, with the, the most economic solutions, with the things that can be deployed the quickest, and we're still not winning. And so we need to win over public opinion, and, and the public need to go through that process, I, I strongly believe, to, to arrive at a point where they're going to act. So, Nick, something you mentioned there that I wanted to just pick up on and see if you could give us more detail on that is that you, you actually funded this yourself. And maybe can you take us a step back and uh, tell us a little bit about your career and how that how that came to be something that you could be in a position to do. Yeah, I'm glad I'm sitting down for this bit because I go weak at the knees every time we get in, in, into this part of it. So <laughs> I, I used to be manufacturing. So I used to be uh, ceramics, clay roof tile making and um, lovely business. Very, I was very passionate about it. It was a family business and, and we, we sold that. So I got myself into a comfortable position, moved down to Devon thinking I'd live a happy life. And spend all my time surfing. Um, but then, you know, obviously you, your worries shift from one thing to another thing and the climate just took over in, in my mind. But I had a taste of being an intensive energy user, a taste of understanding the climate crisis that led to a broadening of knowledge. So I think once you've got, got into the sphere, into the bubble, you, you carry on expanding your knowledge because you're drawn to all those stories. And, and that's it in essence and it's just that factor of time between between when i first came into it probably around the time of the stern report when george monbiot wrote heat around around those sort of times to now when like i said earlier you know the the grown-ups haven't turned up yet and we're still not taking this seriously so i had this sort of feeling inside and i think it came to a point on a a holiday I go on with a group of, of old college friends to the Alps. And I said to them one year, guys, should we not fly? If we take the train, uh, we could save two and a half tons of carbon. And they all looked at me like I was a little bit odd. And it's at that point I realized I'm reading very different things to you. And so I, I it's quite lonely over here knowing what I know, not nice. knowing how to tell you what I know without sounding a little bit, you know, a little bit crazy. and. And that was the driver. And if you roll it out and really think about it, I'm in a position where I was planning to leave my kids money. If we are on the course for, I don't know, is it two and a half now? Is it three degrees? Um, do you think that money's going to A, exist or B, be of any use? It doesn't really matter which one. Um, and I think, strongly think, once I've tried to sort of put myself forward into the future, that I'll be kicking myself that I didn't do something with some of the resources I had back now in this time. And it, it this was went around in my head for a long time. And it, I, it, I think it was that Kevin Anderson talk that I knew no one would watch that was what tipped me. I said, right, I said, I'm going to spend some money. And so it, it's been a very strange experience. It's been enlightening and, in, and, and it, it's been heartwarming and inspiring. But also you do have periods where you think, what am I doing? I'm wasting money, blowing money. Will this work? Will it fail? But yeah, I decided from the beginning, I'm just going to go for it. How, how do your kids feel about it? Uh, I just get some wry smiles back from them. Um, <laughs> okay. And, and my daughter has said, look, I'll only be impressed um, 
when you get this list of actors and comedians involved in one of your projects. Um, so she's already got designs on who has to be next. Okay. So you, you've got a list and you're, you're ticking off some names. How far down? <laughs> some, how, something how, like that. How far down have you gotten? Oh, well, uh, yeah, no, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to misspeak because we might get the wrong comedian and not, and not satisfy them. But no, I think, <laughs> you know what, the younger generation get it. And, and I think seeing that as a grown up doing something about it, I think, I think that makes, just makes sense to them. Do they think you're cooler now? I don't think they'd tell me if they did, so I won't okay. ever know the answer to that question. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Claire, I think you wanted to come in with a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, part of me was saying, I think it partly depends on the age of your kids as to what point they come round again to thinking actually what you did was pretty cool because there's definitely a phase when nothing you would do is cool <laughs> as, a, as a parent. But actually, I wanted to pick up on something else. And again, it comes out to some of the research that you did that you um, published alongside, which was around the fact that, again, there's a difference between scientists and the level of them who believe we already have the types of solutions Um we're just not rolling them out as fast as we should be versus the level of awareness in the general public. And it got me thinking, are you, is that something you're going to explore with the same format? Because certainly from my perspective and probably Richard and all the rest of us in the sector, at time there were completely nonsensical decisions made um, by those in leadership and almost taking that comedic approach of like, here's a really sensible set of things we could do and yet our government chooses to do something really stupid and to use humor to again get at that and start to bring that into public consciousness is that something you thought might be part of what you do going forward well i th i think um that you know we we would do that through the means of, of creating public pressure because uh i mean on, on the one hand you can overestimate the extent to which MPs, for example, know about all this stuff. I, you know, there's a lot of MPs that don't just simply don't turn up to climate briefings. And again, that don't want to know and are also, um, you know, heavily influenced by, by financial vested interests from the fossil fuel industry and others. Um, but if the public aren't, aren't sufficiently aware, then they can get away with it. Uh, and uh, it is very striking in the survey that, you know, there's a huge gap in awareness between climate scientists and the public, uh, in, and, and both good and bad. You know, like, I think 88% um, uh, of climate scientists turned out to be pessimistic about the next 20 years, and then only 39% of the public. So that, there's a massive gap in awareness, and, and these are from the people who are closest to, the, to what's going to happen. On the other side of the coin, they're also um, much more likely to believe that we can fix it if not fix it entirely, uh, deal with it because they're more aware of, of you know, renewables and other solutions. Mm. But that's positive. But, but our goal is partly to breach that gap. So what you're saying is that in terms of the findings that climate scientists, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, are more aware that there are solutions than the, the general public in the research you did. Yes? Absolutely. I think 92% I think, think uh, that we've got the knowledge and tools to, to address it. Mm. Uh, and I think only 61% of the public, right. quite a gap. Yes. And I think we did have Michael Barnard on the show not too long ago. And he, I think his, his view at the MP, about MPs is that they often have, you know, are, are nice people and well-intentioned, but have the, the science and te te technology background of illiterate newts, I think was his quote. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. Not, I, not, I, not very flattering to newts. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, might, you might be onto something there. So, I guess, you know, the question is really, you know, what kind of maybe tell us a little bit about how far this has gone, right? Like how, how many people have the, the videos reached overall so far? Sorry, I excited that. that. Um, I can answer that. Yeah. So we are, we're past the 3 million mark. Um, uh, we're on, you know, on Twitter. Um, it's gone very, very well on Twitter. Uh, reasonably well on Instagram, Facebook. LinkedIn has proved to be an amazing home for it. Um, and it's a much broader appeal that we're getting this time to last time. And, and I'm particularly bowled over by some of the interactions we're getting on LinkedIn from across the world, really. I was got an email yesterday from the... Um, Earth Observatory of Singapore from a PhD scientist there copied in with a uh, some some someone else from the world of business saying we're really interested in doing something like this in Singapore can we chat and we have quite a lot in our inbox like that 
Um, and we do have um, designs on taking this to the States as well. So, so we're really seeing the, the reach broaden out. We're seeing people in the climate space reflect back to us that they really think this is a good method of doing it, you know, of handling the, the seriousness of it, of cutting through, of, of leaving people in a position where they feel they've got some agency. So, you know, I don't want to speak too soon, but it really feels like it's, it's, it's going well. And then, of course, we have another film lined up for just before COP. So mm. we are in a bit of the eye of the storm at the moment. And I think we'll probably be reflecting properly when that film has landed and we see its true impact. Right. Um, so right before COP, can you uh, give your, our audience here an exclusive hint about who's going to be in it? It's a, it's a, it's a very famous uh, British comedian that everyone's heard of. Okay. <laughs> in, 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 in the, I would say, borderline national treasure category. Oh, gosh. What? Well, okay. Uh, well, I will I will absolutely look forward to that. And that you, you mentioned that's going to drop right before uh, the Conference of the Parties in Dubai. Yes? Uh, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's dropping either next week or the week after. Oh, great. Okay. And so by the time people listen to this, it'll be perhaps this week, uh, which is great. Okay. So three million, you know, kind of, views it's reached quite a few people and you've got interest from around the world um you know you're talking about potentially taking on the road to the states i suppose you know what else do you plan to do is, is there like a live version of this in in the future the albert hall perhaps i mean there, there, there's uh, all sorts of i guess i guess taking it uh, to the states is one thing but also um you know that how, how do we get to your point earlier, how do we get the widest possible distribution? You know, can we get it on on mainstream TV, for example? Uh, maybe working with some some people who are already in this space. You know, the idea is to get it beyond the bubble and to get it in in front of people who are, so far are, are not listening uh, sufficiently. I suppose there'll need to be a safe for work version that goes on telly. We can't really have uh, Nish saying Kant on Channel Four, I guess. Even even Channel Four draw the line. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, it's it's been interesting this time around. Um, you know, the, the the first ones we did. I mean, Jonathan Pye is can can you know who's like a very famous online ranter can swear for you know as much as anyone. Um, and and there was some pushback on oh, particularly in older generations. Well, you know what what's why why do we need to swear? But this time around, even though the language was even fruitier, that we've had hardly any of that. And I think I think for us it's not just oh isn't it funny to say rude words, it's it's swearing is the language of emergencies. I'd be very surprised if on the decks of the Titanic there wasn't any swearing. You know that's the language you use when you when you want to get people out of a burning building, you have to communicate it with sufficient um, urgency. So yes, it, we've got a, a non-sweary version as well, but right. the swear has a purpose. Well, I think I think it's true that I, if I learned this somewhere, that the you know most common last words on a Black Rocks recorder are indeed "oh shit," um, you know, when the plane goes down. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah, that kind of that's that stacks up. Um, so, Claire, I know you want to ask a question about another aspect of what they might be planning for the future. Well, yeah, I'm just you know we're we're all aware that there are going to be upcoming elections uh, in the not too distant future, and given that the aim of this is to try to get few people who don't normally think about climate change and the impacts on them and what we actually need is political leaders who are motivated to make better decisions for us is there any plans to look at how you might try to coincide some of your work with some of that campaigning time to try to influence the debate claire we might have I mean, to invite you to our next planning meeting actually that's a, that's a very good question and yes, I mean, this is going to be the climate election, isn't it? Um, I guess uh, we are wholly focused on f this second film and, and that is something we will certainly be taking on board. Um, yeah, I don't, I, for me, climate, this election, there's, there's going to be, there's going to have been nothing like it. So that could just be an area to look at. Yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of time up in Scotland and in politics there and there was a, there was a time pre-devolution where there was a broader political debate and then it became pretty much you are either for a devolved Scotland or not in the same way that Brexit has become a divisive issue and it almost narrows the debate and becomes quite a binary choice. And I think, as you say, it's a you know, we're at a really critical juncture now where 
scientists say we've got lots of solutions, but we don't have lots of time. So it be I will be watching with a uh, in the <laughs> to see how you know. And I know that there's been other campaigns sort of that uh, that have tried to use sort of public engagement and humour as a way to sort of put big issues on the on the map. So be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I think there's there's uh, almost two things. There's the there's the British election. And um, I mean, there are other people in the climate space doing interesting stuff. I think Dale Vince is doing a big push. And, and to some extent, uh, this might be able to overlap with, with some of that. But then we have to think as well um, globally, because there's another election coming up, which is the American election. And that um, possibly is going to have the most impact of all. Um, so I, I know that it's quite easy in the UK to focus on the kind of, you know, UK climate policies, but I, I guess this is going to be fixed globally. So we, we have to kind of keep an eye on that, uh, as well to the extent we can. Hmm. So any, any plans to, uh, take it as well, the, the kind of direction of, uh, confronting anybody in the, in fact, in the oil and gas industry, I can imagine, you know, not necessarily with covering them in orange paint or, um, you know, kind of uh, dumping oil on their building or anything like that, but, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, Ali G is due for, you know, coming back to do, it's not Ali G, but <laughs> Sasha, Sasha Baron Cohen is due for come back and, uh, you know, maybe interview some oil CEOs. Well, that's that's a brilliant idea. We'll, we'll take that. Uh, thank you, Richard. Okay, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll wait for the check. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's not a lot of money in climate action, it turns out. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, I think that that goes back to one of the points you raised earlier about, you know, which comedians are we using? And I think one, one key factor has been, can they do angry? Uh, in the sense that, you know, you could go for someone who's quite cynical and uh, that would be the lazy way out mm. in a way. But, but what we need is people, we don't want people to come away from these having just been amused. We want them to come away feeling uh, emotionally involved and angered to the point of action. So, so some people like Jonathan Pye or Nish can be funny at the same time as they as they really mean what they say, and you feel that they mean it. So that's mm. quite to us. Well, I I think it's it, comedy is such a I mean weirdly, although it's it's enjoyed by so many people, a kind of a, in my view a misunderstood thing, in that you know most comedians who I know are generally finding a way to transmute their own personal pain in life into something that's funny. Um, and indeed, you know, I mean, one recent example that we had of, of somebody who, a brilliant comedian who was able to look at an utterly tragic situation and turn it to some comic effect, not for lazy cynicism, but actually to try and challenge the assumptions of the audience was when Bassam Youssef was interviewed by Pierce Morgan. Uh, not too long ago, which is a, a name oh, I never yes. thought I'd say on this show. Did you guys see that? I mean, it's yes. I, yeah. amazing. Having, having, having spent some time in, you know, in the Muslim world and in the Arab world, seeing that, you know, for a Western audience kind of come across, it really, I think, shook a lot of people. Um, of, and I think was a good almost roadmap about how to, how to do comedy about something that's really tragic, awful, very, very serious. And yet, you know, kind of, that cuts through in a way that very few other ways of communicating do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, a, a, a lot of the, the, the scripts end with a, a call to action where they're kind of, they're being funny, but they're not joking. They, they really do want you to get out there and, 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 and you've, got to, you've got to feel that. It's got to inspire you to action. And then, as you say, at, at the very end, we almost, it's almost like we turn off the cameras and we let the comedian ask the scientist what, what's really going on here. And, and that's a lot of people's favorite bit where you kind mm. of feel it's behind the scenes. It's like what you would say to the scientist down the pub. You go, look, is this, is this exaggerated? Is it for real? Should I be afraid? Um, and, and I think, again, that's a, that's a way of, of humanizing the scientist that, that helps Excellent. Um, well, listen, you've, you've mentioned some of the influences that you've had. You've mentioned um, Kevin Anderson's talk. You've mentioned George Monbiot. Anything else that's that's influenced you, whether that's about climate or indeed about the use of comedy or anything else that, you know, is going to eventually you, you're thinking about this project. Uh, that's for both of you. Um, well, Genevieve Gun Gunter uh, taking sort of Shakespearean um, 
Renaissance um, English literature and applying it to something. It never occurred to me that. And I, and I love people who come in from a different sector and look at everyone who's just so focused on data and numbers and science and sort of try and give it a different spin because we're trying to appeal and communicate with, with humans after all. So I found that particularly inspiring. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a big fan of the climate and ecology bill. So there's the zero hour campaign. And that makes me feel that we might be able to solve our way out of this um, by making it cross-party, taking it out of you know out of day-to-day politics, and it becomes a binding piece of law that's built into our system with citizens' assembly. So I really, really feel that it is something to hold on to, and that is something to promote. Um, other things, and at the moment, I'm quite enjoying the Age of Transformation newsletter from Nafis Ahmed. I mean that. Mm-hmm is effective because I think he's talking to the kind of people that I would like to, it's the whole thing of understanding how, how tenuous systems are. And I do come across people in, in work and in life who, who work in, who have agency, who work in industries, who have all this influence, who do not have any understanding of the fragility of everything. So hearing people who can talk so, um, so fluently about our systems and how vulnerable they are, I found that quite powerful as well. I mean, I, I find, uh, you know, a, a lot of the Don't Look Up um, by Adam McKay was was uh, a great uh, boost, I think, in the sense that you could you could make it. And obviously it's not. It, it is about the climate, but it's indirect. But it was just had a kind of um, punchiness to it mm. uh, and humor that it, we can totally relate to. I Yeah, I mean, I think... I'd, I suppose a lot of people, it divided a lot of opinion about whether or not it worked. I mean, just as, as comedy, you know, kind of blending it towards a, or bending towards a quite serious thing, as you say, you know, clearly that it's about climate without being about climate. Um, as much as people might have enjoyed seeing Meryl Streep get eaten by an alien at the end. Um, spoiler, sorry. Spoiler. Uh, spoiler, Mark. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, do, do you think that that worked as, as comedy? Well, I, you know, I guess some people didn't get it. Uh, possibly, I've, I've I've definitely seen, I've definitely read uh, an entire review where where someone just hadn't got the basic point. Oh. Um, but I, I, you know, look, you've got to hope if if people are um, miss the point that badly, then we're doomed. So you, you've got to have some faith in humanity that we are going to eventually. You know, all all wake up and rally round and um, get it, get on top of this. Um, but but as you say, if if ninety nine percent of people don't get it, then then we are in trouble. Uh, well, actually, that just leads me on to a question that I it's just starting to sort of run around my head, which is around the demographics of who you're trying to target, or is that even something you've started thinking about? You know, you talked about it's been doing really well on Twitter and it's been doing well on LinkedIn. Um, but, you know, are you thinking like you need to get into TikTok? You know, let's think of sort of younger generations or, or, or are they already there? Do they not need this sort of convincing? And or if they do, are you looking at different comedians who are going to appeal to, to different demographics? I think that was just sort of like, is there, is there a particular group that you feel are really important for you to get to? I, I, I mean, think... go on, Ben, you, you shoot. Go for it. Well, for, for me, um... We we're we're on TikTok and and the the, the youth um, eyeballs are not a priority, but it's still going to be a part of it because TikTok drives so many things. As my kids always tell me, Instagram's driven by TikTok. Everything is driven by TikTok. But I was quite heavily focused when I first conceived this on the people in sort of my age bracket, so you know forty, fifty up to people who have people who have done quite well or made it into their senior position and are really in the dark, and people who have agency, or just people who are strong members of a community but it is that older slightly older demographic who who would never do activism um who who weren't really part of um early recycling movements and other things that have led a lot of people into what they do now there are some people who just don't find an affinity with the activist movements but it doesn't mean their values are any different but their newspapers might be different and what they read might be different so i guess it's the moderates i mean i know there are lots of groups who've done lots of you know, um, social demographic sort of segmentation on on all these areas, but it's really just trying to reach the moderates and they all have agency somewhere. 
Um, you know, as we progress, I think we might become more sophisticated and, and, and break it down in different ways and indeed target certain groups. But to get us moving, it was a, this huge swathe of middle in England, if you like, who, yeah, they could tell you what climate change is. They could probably tell you even a little bit about the physics, but they wouldn't be able to tell you anything about the timings, the urgency, the carbon budgets, none of that. Mm. So, so it's, it's, for me, it started off quite broad. We didn't want to pin it down too much at the beginning. Right, right. I mean, I, we, we, we um, you know, as Utopia Bureau, we come from an advertising background, so we do think in terms of demographics uh, a bit. I mean, the, we, we decided from the outset there was no point uh, trying to target climate deniers because they are, um, they're not, you know, the lowest hanging fruit. It, it is um, the moderates, but it's probably um, shifting people who, who care at some level. Who, who are aware, who would probably yeah. say they are worried, but aren't fully aware of just how worried they should be. And, and, and really ramping that up, uh, bringing them up to date and moving them towards, let's not call it activism because that word has become uh, a bit tricky, but moving them towards action in, in, in whatever form that takes. That's the, that's the underlying aim. Cool. No, that's really helpful to understand and, and makes perfect sense in terms of, of where you might actually be able to create the most impact going forwards. Great. Well, look, Ben, Nick, you've been so generous with your time. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, so you've just, you're just uh, by the time people hear this, you'll have just finished a crowdfunding exercise to be able to have people come in and help support, you know, the project going forward. Um, you know, where else can people find you if they want to get in touch about offering their support for the future? Well, our, our website is climatesciencebreakthrough.com. Uh, That's probably the uh, easiest way um, uh, to find us or um, I guess uh, look us up on, on, on Twitter if Twitter still exists um, in a few months. Or do you by the time people hear this? But like, that's great. We'll leave that in the show notes as well as any the, the social coordinates you mentioned. You've had some great pickup on Insta on LinkedIn as well. So we'll we'll definitely share that there. Um, and then, yeah, any any final thoughts, anything we haven't talked about so far that you'd like to mention before we part? I would just like to call on people to like, share and interact with all our output. It, it, it all relies on, you know, we don't have a huge promotional budget. It all relies on the interactions of, of you great people out there. So just get behind our output wherever you see it, please. And I, I would say, so the, you know, the, the one thing about the films that we haven't mentioned is that they, they literally show what needs to be done. You've got two very different people from very different parts of, the, of, of you know, the UK coming together to kind of try and, and sort this out. And that that's really the modeling what we all need to do. We, we need kind of, I think the film says all hands on deck now. It's, it's, mm. it's past time for deciding whether you're going to act or not. We all need to get going now. Uh, and that, that's the message that kind of the films try to embody. Well, look, I think that's the perfect place to leave it. So Ben Carey from Utopia Bureau and Nick Aldridge. Both of you working on the Climate Science Breakthrough Project. Very innovative. Check it out on the socials. Check it out. Give it a little bit of love. Help to get reshare it. And we're all looking forward with bated breath to see who your next guest is, who your next comedians are, and scientists, indeed. Thanks. Thanks. It's been delightful. Thanks, guys. Yes. Right. Well, guys, that was great. How do you think that went? Yeah, I, I had a helicopter hovering in the background. Oh, no. That was <laughs> Um, no, yeah. I see, yeah, hopefully, yeah, fine, fine. I mean, yeah, you've had some great guests. I've been catching up on, on your, your podcast, actually. You've had some, some fantastic guests. So um, oh, we're good. glad to have played our part. So thank you. No, with, look, I, it's such a great project. And I think, you know, we'll, um, uh, you know, we'll definitely have some audio from, if that's all right with you, given it's, it's your films, um, you know, just, but uh, having checked my, check my British copyright law, and apparently I'm good quoting audio. <laughs> We probably can't say cunts. We almost certainly can't say cunts. Hi, I'm Dr. Freddie Otto, Senior Lecturer in Climate Science at Imperial College London, and my expertise is in weather attribution. Hi, I'm Nish Kumar, comedian, and my expertise is triggering your racist uncle, often just by opening my mouth. 
Human-caused climate change is fundamentally changing the fabric of the weather as we know it. It's leading to events which we've simply never seen before. Translation, weather used to be clouds. Now we've made it into a sort of Rottweiler on steroids that wants to chew everyone's head off. The continuing increase in global average temperature is already causing higher probabilities of extreme rainfall and flash flooding, as well as more intense storms, prolonged droughts, record-breaking heat waves and wildfires. Very soon climate scientists are just going to ditch their graphs and point out the window with an expression that says, I fucking told you! This is not a problem just for our children or grandchildren. This is an immediate threat to all our lives. I don't know if you're familiar with the film The Terminator, but if someone came from the future to warn us of this threat, they'd have travelled from next Wednesday. We have entered an era of food and water insecurity. Heat waves are already causing crop failures across the world and worsening water shortages. During lockdown, we had shortages of bog roll that nearly caused a civil war in Waitrose. Wait until what we've run out of is food. The good news is that we have solutions. Renewables are now much cheaper than oil and gas, as well as less polluting. Switching over will save us trillions and improve the quality of our lives in the process. Wait, so you're saying that we can avoid all of this? What in the renewable wind-powered fuck is stopping us? For decades, fossil fuel companies have run misinformation campaigns and now they are lobbying governments for new oil and gas fields. Option one, make a change that's ten times cheaper and will literally save the world. Option two, give some cunts more money. Tricky, isn't it? There is still time to prevent the worst outcomes if we stop burning fossil fuels. Share this video and get involved with others. The overwhelming majority of people want change before it's too late. Huge change does happen, but only if we get our act together and act. What did you think of my translation? Well, I think they were a bit more blunt than I would usually dare to do, but I think they are actually quite helpful. Do you feel listened to as a scientist at the moment? Listen to maybe, but they don't hear what I'm saying. Is there a room in your house where you just go and you just sort of like, or like a cupboard or something where you can just lock the door and then just howl your frustrations out? No, but the dog gets very long walks. So. <laughs> What's the thing that keeps you hopeful? We have all the technology and all the knowledge. What we're struggling with is doing it. There are examples where things have really changed in a short amount of time. We've shifted the dial. That keeps me hopeful. We can do this.